Okay, so we've been um, talking about the kidneys and water balance. You may have missed some of that, so be sure to check that lecture if you missed um, reviewing it. But just a quick summary. Remember that kidneys are critical for getting rid of nitrogenous waste. And so <clears throat> when your proteins are broken down through metabolism into amino acids or your nucleic acids that you've eaten are broken down, there's also nitrogenous bases associated with it. They get broken down into these amine groups because remember amino acids are made up of these amine groups. And then they get um, secreted if you're an aquatic animal like fish, freshwater fish as uh, ammonia. But terrestrial animals like ourselves mostly get rid of our nitrogenous waste through a product called urea, which um, <clears throat> helps us to avoid water loss as being terrestrial animals. That doesn't mean there can't be a little bit of ammonia in our urine as well. And then there's also uric acid. This is mostly insects and birds. So they get rid of their nitrogenous waste through uric acid. This is the way to maximize maintaining a good water balance and not losing water to the environment. So insects, which would dry up quickly if they used urea or ammonia, um, use uric acid, or at least particularly the terrestrial ones. That's why when you look at bird pee on your windshield, it's bird poop is what you might call it because there's poop in there as well, but it's so white because of that uric acid and why it's so hard to get off your windshields because it's hydrophobic solution for the most part. It, it doesn't like water, it doesn't dissolve in water. While urea, as you know, does dissolve in water. So when you urinate, you're obviously getting rid of urea, the nitrogenous waste. Now, if you talk about carbohydrates and fats, that is mostly lost through breathing and metabolism. So when you're breathing out carbon dioxide, you're getting rid of um, carbohydrates and fat. So when you lose weight, ultimately, lots of weight, fat weight, when you're losing body fat, it's mostly breathing it out. It isn't sweating it out or anything like that. Now, there's lots of primitive uh, kidneys. We've talked a little bit about this also, like this, the flame cells in um, flatworms. They will absorb um, nitrogenous waste and other waste and excrete it through excretory pores. That's one of the things we mentioned in the last lecture. And then we start to see what you call a primitive kidney. That's a lot like what we would have um, so the, the most primitive would be like these flame cells and flatworms, but you start to see a, a little bit more complex kidney in earthworms, where you actually have capillaries in a closed circulatory system, and the solutions in the water actually, in the waste, nitrogenous waste and so forth, are excreted into this nephrostrome. And so that's a lot like a kidney, and we call that metanephridia. We also mentioned that insects have an open circulatory system and they use malpighian tubules as their kidneys where it filters the blood in the hemocell. And so here you can see the midgut and you can see the malpighian tubules absorbing water and, and waste. So it actually uses a common port um, down from the midgut where food is absorbed in the insect and then the hindgut where its waste goes out. Well, the nitrogenous waste go, is made as uric acid, as I mentioned, and leaves with the food that wasn't absorbed as well. So this gets us to talking about kidneys and um, vertebrate animals. So you had some ideas from invertebrates. Again, the urinary system is critical for getting rid of nitrogenous waste, toxins, drugs, things that aren't supposed to be in your body. It's also critical, the urine and how much you pee and don't pee for water balance, electrolytes. Um, it's important for blood pressure. Um, your kidneys are also involved with other hormones like making more red blood cells through erythropoietin or even uh, helping with calcium regulation and the activation of vitamin D. 
So your kidneys do a lot of things. Even the adrenal glands are closely associated with the kidneys. As you know, adrenal glands would help with um, flight or fright responses. So here's the basic structure of the kidney going back. You see the kidneys are actually on the back side of your body. So you, they would be covered in front ventrally by intestines and so forth. While the kidneys are laying next to your back, um, you have two kidneys, which is good because if one goes out, the other one can continue doing the work. And it's found right between the mid back and the lower back. So it's, that is where the kidneys are, are found. And you'll see blood vessels like the inferior vena cava going to it. And of course, there's all sorts of arteries and capillaries associated with it, as you can see here. The kidneys essentially filter the blood plasma that's floating around in your blood, getting rid of the urea, and then concentrating, um, taking back as much water as needed or not for, os you know, for you know, osmoregulation in your body. Then the waste ultimately goes down the uter to the urinary uh, bladder. And then of course is um, excreted through the urethra, um, its final stopping point going outside of your body. So here's the kidneys of this person on the left and you can zoom in, you can see the kidneys. You'll see that um, the left one is a little bit higher than the right kidney. And then if you were to get a kidney and you may, did, you may have done this when you did your cat dissection, you slice it in half and you look inside it, you can see there's a darker area and a lighter area. The darker area is known as the medulla and the outer layer is called the cortex. Inside the kidneys are lots of nephrons. Nephrons are important. They are the, there's millions of them in your kidney and their job is to filter your blood plasma, concentrating the urine. Ultimately, these are the, um, the functional units of your kidney, these nephrons. Some of them are mostly in the medulla part where it's dark. And then some of them do come out and extend into the cortex. But all these extra, extra tubes are what there's lots and lots of tubes coming from these nephrons and capillaries that the medulla becomes darker in comparison to the cortex. Here's a little bit more. There's a, the outside of the kidney is called the capsule. So if you're to dissect it, you would see these different layers. And then when the urine is formed, it'll all lead into this renal pelvis and then down the utera, utera to the urinary bladder. Again, here's the basic anatomy of the kidney. You have your, um, you know, your capsid on the outside, you have your outer cortex, and then you have your medulla on the inside. And again, it's darker because of all the excess extra tubules and capillaries that are, are found there. So you can see the blood vessels come in from the arteries, because remember arteries leave the heart, travel into the kidneys, then they'll go to these nephrons, and you'll see that in a moment when I show you some other pictures where it's actually filtered. The urine, or, and again, it's the blood plasma that's being filtered, the urea out of it, particularly in the toxins and things like that. They'll go down these tubules and then the blood vessels and the blood cells will return via the um, veins. Because remember the veins take the blood back to the heart. So here's the kidneys again, and you can see the nephron. You can see the outer cortex, the medulla. You can see the renal artery and the renal vein, which will bring the blood in and, and then take the blood back out. And then the blood plasma will be filtered into um, urea, uh, urea, in the case of us, and then travel down the, uh, you know, the renal, um, region to the ureter, or uter, uter, excuse me, down to the kidneys. Again, the functional unit of your kidneys is known as the nephron. So here's how you spell it, N-E-P-H-R-O-N. -E so the nephrons is the functional unit. 
And again, each kidney has around a million nephrons. So the functional unit of kidneys is the nephron. And they are re remarkable in its ability to regulate water throughout the rest of your body. You can see why kidneys are so critical for your survival. So if you drink too much water, the kidneys will get rid of that excess water. If you don't drink enough water, they will try to conserve the water. And so your urine be would become more yellow. This is what the nephron looks like if you stretched it out. The front part of the nephron is called the Bowman's capsule. And so you can see that this is this red thing is our, um, what we call it an atrial. So it's basically a small artery broken into these capillaries called the, um, the glomerus. That is what that is called. So the ball of capillaries that filters blood plasma is called the glomerus. That's this right here. And then what happens is there's enough blood pressure to actually push out the blood plasma. Remember the blood plasma is the watery part of the blood. And that'll enter into the Bowman's capsule, the watery part, but the blood cells will remain. And so the watery portion of the blood will enter into the Bowman's capsule. And then we'll travel down these renal tubules where the, the blood plasma, which is now basically becoming urine, will become concentrated. Some of the water will, will return to these paratubular capillaries. So we call this filtrate. So when the blood plasma is uh, being filtered, it goes into the Bowman's capsule. Again, it's gonna be the blood plasma, not the blood cells, the, the toxins, the excess nitrogenous waste. And that since it's being filtered, it'll be called filtrate. <clears throat> and then we'll enter into the renal tubules. And then it'll travel through these renal tubules, as I mentioned before, where depending on the needs of the body, the urine will either become more concentrated or more watery. If it needs to be more concentrated, the, um, because you're trying to retain your water, these paratubular capillaries will pull back more of the water from this um, renal tubule. If it needs to be more concentrated, then less will come out. And then that'll be the composition of your urine ultimately that travels down to the urinary bladder. Here's another picture showing you the nephrons. This will give you a better understanding of the functional unit here. And this previous picture makes it look linear, but it's not linear, it's actually curved. And so again, the capillaries that enter into the Bowman's capsule are called the glomerus. So that's what this is. These are an actual picture of the capillaries. They removed the Bowman's capsule so you could look inside it and look at the um, capillaries all bunched together. And then if you look over here, they removed, there's all sorts of capillaries that are associated with it. Uh, the paratubular um, capillaries. So here's the glomerous capillaries and then here's the paratubular capillaries. Well, in this picture, they removed it just so you could see the nephron a little bit easier. And so you'll see that the part that's near the Bowman's capsule is called the proximal tubule. And then you'll see the descending loop, and then it gets thinner and thinner. And then this is, I believe, called the, the loop of Henley. And then you have an ascending loop. Then you have a, um, an ascending loop that can call the distal, excuse me, the distal tubule. And then it goes to a collecting tubule. And then this is where it travels down to the bladder. So this is the only place that the water absorption but it'll make the urine more concentrated, less concentrated takes place. And again, it's gonna be with the help of these paratubular capillaries that aren't shown in this picture. And it'll be based on the salt concentration of the medulla. But this is why the medulla is so much darker. It's because of all these tubes that are going up and down in the medulla. So if you look over here at this picture here, you can see the cortex where you can see some of the glomeruses and all well, the nephrons starting and then traveling down into medulla. 
and then, but again, for the most of the nephrons, the majority of it's actually located in the medulla. So again, that's one of the reasons why the medulla looks a lot more concentrated or darker in color than the cortex. And so when you combine the two, it's called a juxtamedullar nephron uh, with the vas recta. So that's what they're referring to with all these extra capillaries associated with it. That's what the whole thing will be called. But once it's gone through this loop of Henle and traveled down the distal tubule and starts going into the collection duct, at that point, it's going to be urine and nothing else is going to happen with it. It's not going to become less concentrated or more concentrated. Again, it's the loop of Henle that concentrates or, or reduces the concentration of urine. And this is based on the concentration of salts and other chemicals that are found in the medulla. Now the animals that are very desert orientated, meaning that they live in a drought stricken environment and can't drink much water like the desert gerbil, will have a huge long loop of Henle that's dramatically longer than ourselves. And that is so they can maximize concentrating the urine, making it very, very concentrated. <clears throat> and so the loop of Henley will be really long in a desert animal like a desert gerbil. This is what the gomers looks like. It's basically these capillaries, but they're surrounded by another group of cells um, that help in the filtering. And I believe those cells are called uh, podocytes. So these are podocytes here. So that's a cell, see the nucleus? So this is a podocyte. Here's another podocyte. And again, the, the blood's gonna come down the efferent atrial, enter into the capillaries called glomerus. It's gonna run around the glomerus. And then the watery um, plasma is gonna be filtered through the glomerus through these spaces here. So this is the capillaries. The, what the podocytes do is they provide a lot of extra structure to the capillary so that, because there's a lot of blood pressure going through there for a capillary. And so it's basically providing a little, acting like a grit, a grate. And it's also providing a little bit of extra structure to help prevent the, the, uh, the capillaries from being damaged. So they have two different uh, jobs. And so if you look over here in this electron micrograph picture, you can see the capillaries underneath, that's where the arrows are pointing. And then on top of it is the podocytes, again, helping to um, prevent, you know, function as a filter and help or, and, and provide a little extra reinforcement to the capillaries so they're not damaged by blood pressure. So that's where, so what happens then is the blood plasma, again, as I mentioned, before is filtered, and then that filtered plasma goes into the Bowman's capsule in this space. And that is called filtrate. And then the filtrate will travel down the proximal tubule and then go through the loop of Henle and all that kind of stuff. Here are some more pictures showing you the, um, the Bowman's capsule. And this picture here, they removed the Bowman's capsule so you can see the glomerus. So you can see the glomerus is just tons and tons of capillaries where there are podocytes surrounding it. So there's lots of surface area there and that helps to filter the blood plasma. Over here, you can zoom in in the glomerus and you can see podocytes helping to reinforce the capillaries and prevent the blood, um, and again, to concentrate the blood plasma. So here's podocytes. And then <clears throat> the blood is filtered and it enters into the Bowman's capsule. So they cut through it to see a, a cross section. And then the filtrate comes into the Bowman's capsule and travels down this proximal tubule. Again, it's the blood pressure from the arteries, the atrioles, the atrial blood pressure that is the driving force for filtering that blood through the capillaries. And so looking at the Bowman's capsule again, 
you can see the glomerus is, is causing filtrate to enter into the lumen. Then you enter into the, the urine, the very dilute urine it comes, it's, it's no different really for the most part than blood plasma, enters into the proximal tubule. Then you can see there's some reabsorption that takes place into the capillaries. And the capillaries may secrete other waste, salts, whatever, into the proximal tubule. Then the tubule will start traveling down the loop of Henley and will provide um, reabsorption of water if needed or less reabsorption of water, depending on the circumstances. Then it'll start traveling up the loop of Henley. More reabsorption of water takes place, concentrating the urine, ultimately getting more and more concentrated in the distal tubule, and then entering into the collection tubule, where more water is ultimately re reabsorbed if possible until it gets to the point that it's getting close to the uh, leaves and goes down the uter, ultimately leaving the uh, kidneys, where it is then you know, in your bladder and then you're going to urinate it. Here's another picture showing you how the nephron is situated in the kidneys. You can see that um, the Bowman's capsule may be on the outside in the cortex, but the loop of Henle and the vasa recta capillaries and all sorts of um, reabsorption capillaries take place around the loop of Henle. And then it'll reach up to the distal side. And then again, it'll start to travel down the collection duct, ultimately entering into the uh, pelvic area, I think it's called the renal pelvic area, um, where it then travels down the uter. So again, the main job of the vasa rector is to concentrate the urine as it travels through it. This is showing you some pictures of the salts being reabsorbed into the paratubular capillaries, and then down to the uh, vasorecta capillaries, but water is being moved in and out as it travels down the um, loop of Henley. So this is kind of your the big part of your story. Um, the loop of Henley actually kind of functions as a counter current multiplier. What happens is, again, focusing on the osmolarity, and that's what's being shown in this picture. Um, the osmolarity is the salt concentration, the amount of solutes in the solution. You'll see that the glomerus comes in and the blood plasma and the filtrate are gonna be similar in their concentration because you know, it's basically water and your urea and things that are coming from the blood plasma entering in to the Bowman's capsule. There you can see the osmolarity is around 300. And then the loop of Henle, now this is the vasa recta would normally be around the loop of Henle, but as the um, urine starts traveling down the loop of Henle, you'll see that water is being reabsorbed, making the concentration of the salt in the, in the salts and the solutes, not just salts, the osmolarity greater and greater as it travels down the loop of Henley. So we go from 300 to 1,000. So the urine is really quite concentrated now in comparison to the proximal tubule. Then you'll notice that the loop of Henley starts traveling back up and that's what causes the counter current because this is going in one direction and this is going in the opposite direction. So you have a counter current. And so then salt starts getting pumped out of the, um, the distal side because the salts in the medulla are less than the outside. Because see, here's the medulla concentrations of salt, the osmolarities. So you can see that 
water is initially always leaving the proximal tubule and the in the descending loop of Henle because the medulla is a little bit more concentrated. So see, here we have 600 osmolarity, but here we have 700 osmolarity in the medulla. So water moves from an area of um, higher concentration of solutes. So again, the water keeps moving out because it's always a little bit more concentrated in the medulla than in the loop. Does that make sense? So the water is leaving here we have 800 osmolarity in the loop of Henle. So water is gonna to move to the area of higher concentration, 900. And then when we start to ascend back up, what happens is the salts get kicked out by sodium chloride channels or pumps, depending on the, whether, if it uses ATP to, um, well, initially it's diffusion. So that's what it's saying here. So it's initially diffusion. So the salts are leaving initially because the salts are more concentrated over here. So here we have 1100, but the salts are only a thousand. So the solutes and the salts are leaving the loop of Henle. It's not until you get to the top of the loop of Henle that you actually use active transport, meaning that you need to use ATP. So again, the loop of Henle is helping in making this concentration gradient across the loop of Henle from a low concentration of the cortex where the osmolarity and the solutes are pretty low to high concentrations of the solute near the bottom of the loop of Henle. So then once it goes across the distal tubule, what happens is the water gets drawn out because again, the urine became um, less concentrated because we got rid of the salts. And then the and the solutes become more concentrated again as it travels down the distal tubule and then ultimately becomes concentrated urine. So this is the way the body maximizes pulling out as much water as needed to make the urine as concentrated as the body can get away with, um, depending on the circumstance. Now, again, if you drink a lot of more water, all these concentrations will vary a little bit. And then your urine will be less concentrated. So it's remarkable that this whole system can control um, to a certain extent the concentration of your urine. But to keep in mind that the kidneys also can do things like use diuretic hormones or release to help get rid of the extra water or antidiuretic depending on the circumstances. So the kidneys are very involved or and helping regulate blood pressure and all sorts of different things as well. And we'll get into that more in another lecture. Um, here's the loops of Henley and a desert gerbil. As I mentioned before, this is an animal that lives in a water scarce environment. So their kidneys are dramatically different pound for pound than our kidneys. The nephrons are huge. So again, this is the kidney cross section through. Here's our outer capsid. Here's our glomerus and Bowman capsules. And then the loops of Henle go all the way down and back up. So that is remarkably longer than what's found in our kidneys. Again, maximizing reabsorption of water and making for very, very concentrated urine. Let's see if we can find um, some examples on YouTube of what I described. The urinary system is best known for removing metabolic wastes from the body in the form of urine, but its importance goes far beyond that function. As the kidneys filter large amounts of blood plasma, they are well positioned to detect changes in blood volume to various solutes, blood pH, and red blood cell count. You're informing. I don't know if you caught that little note, but the kidneys filter about 50 gallons of blood a day. And so you can see the kidneys are an amazing organ for keeping everything working. And why you, if your kidneys go out, both of them, of course, why you are in 
deep doo doo. Luckily, kidney, kidney replacements can take place if you have a proper donor and so forth. Um, blood pH is also very critical, right? Because if you go way outside that blood pH of, not way out, just go a little bit out of the blood pH of being around 7.2. Your, your red blood cells don't work anymore. You can't hold oxygen. Um, your enzymes don't work. Denaturing can take place. All sorts of nasty things can happen. But basically you'll starve yourself of oxygen. First. Blood pH and red blood cell count. Urine formation occurs in functional units of the kidneys called the nephrons. A nephron consists of two major parts, a glomerular capsule or Bowman's capsule and a long renal tubule. Renal tubules of several nephrons connect to a common collecting duct. Basically, blood plasma is first filtered in the Bowman's capsule. The filtrate then moves through the long winding renal tubule alongside a network of blood capillaries before draining into the collecting duct. This long passage is where the blood reabsorbs what is needed and additional wastes are removed. This process determines the composition of urine and is regulated accordingly to the body's needs. The kidneys control blood volume and blood pressure by removing more or less water as necessary. Water excretion by the kidneys is regulated by a number of hormones, including vasopressin, also known as antidiuretic hormone. A high so you know, um, and if you're, of course, if you run into situations where you have high blood pressure or so forth, you can see what's happening is your, med your medical doctor is providing you um, drugs that mimic these hormones and make get your kidneys working in overtime and so forth. So, anti so diuretic um, hormones um, or diuretic drugs um, help you to reduce blood pressure because it gets rid of that extra salt in your body. So that, anyway. Hypothalamic hormone released in response to low blood volume or high plasma osmolality. Vasopressin causes the kidneys to retain more water by increasing water permeability of the collecting duct. Aldosterone, the salt retaining hormone secreted by the adrenal cortex in response to low blood sodium. Aldosterone acts on the distal tubule and collecting duct to increase reabsorption of sodium, which is followed by increased retention of water. The kidneys themselves produce an enzyme called renin in response to low blood pressure. Renin initiates a two-step process that produces the hormone angiotensin II. Angiotensin II increases blood pressure in several ways. It constricts blood vessels, promotes the release of vasopressin and aldosterone, and stimulates thirst centers in the brain to encourage water intake. Atrionaturetic peptide, ANP, secreted by the atrial myocardium of the heart in response to high blood pressure. ANP reduces blood pressure in a number of ways. It directly dilates blood vessels. It increases glomerular filtration rate, thereby removing more fluid in urine. ANP inhibits the secretion of renin and subsequently aldosterone. ANP also inhibits sodium reabsorption by the collecting duct. The kidneys control blood pH by adjusting the amount of excreted acids and reabsorbed bicarbonate. Plasma. So you can see how important the kidneys are in just about every, you know, all the major homeostasis aspects of blood. A bicarbonate is filtered in the glomerulus during the first step of urine formation, then reabsorbed back into the blood in the proximal tubule. The amount of reabsorbed bicarbonate is regulated in response to changes in blood pH. It increases during acid loads and decreases during alkali loads. In addition, the collecting duct also generates new bicarbonate, which exits into the blood during high acid loads. The kidneys secrete erythropoietin, EPO, a stimulating factor for red blood cells formation. So this is actually a very powerful hormone that gets your bone marrow to make new red blood cells. 
Um, obviously, this is a, if you look at this picture here, you can see it's a stem cell. And so this stem cell can become white blood cells or red blood cells. The erythropoietin will trigger it in the bone marrow to make lots and lots of red blood cells. And so here you can see a big nucleus inside the um, red blood cell. And then the nucleus, um, once the cell starts becoming a red blood cell or if it stays at one of the immune white blood cells, um, it'll keep the nucleus if it's going to remain a white blood cell. But if it's going to become a red blood cell, that nucleus is ultimately going to be kicked out. And then you're going to have a red blood cell that looks kind of concave. There's no nucleus in it. And it ultimately comes a bag of hemoglobin. Again, hemoglobin is the um, protein that holds the iron that's responsible for um, holding on to your oxygen atoms. I actually have a little bit of a story about this. So first you re might realize erythropoietin is um, a drug that some um, bicyclists or serious athletes um, have used to illegally, well, illegally in their sport, I guess that's a better way to put it, to break the rules of their sport. And they may obtain it through other, I don't know if it's illegal in regards to United States drug laws, but um, if it was, but my point is, that's what causes blood doping. So you can, there's different ways of blood dope. One way to blood dope is to collect your blood and then put it in the refrigerator or freezer or whatever, come back and give it to you later, not freezer, but, but the other way is to take this drug erythropoietin. So that's one thing that athletes do that are trying to gain, gain an edge in the system. And, if they're, and of course, if there's, if they're, organizing association says you're not supposed to use it, then you may you know, lose your Olympic medal or whatever. <clears throat> well, when I was going through cancer, my, you know, I got to the point where my red blood cells and white blood cells were really taking a big hit from the chemo and I wasn't able to generate them fast enough. And again, remember your bone marrow is responsible for making red blood cells. So I took erythropoietin because I was a cancer patient needing those red blood cells. And it was remarkable how powerful that drug was. Later that day, because you would inject yourself because you would have to take it at home, um, my red blood cells kicked into gear and the bones in my body started radiating. I, mean, I could really feel my hip bones and they were just like, you know, bum, bum, bum. I mean, it felt like this, you know, like somebody, don't, I hard to describe it, but it was just that, you know, if you ever had a headache where it's just kind of beating, but it felt like that in my hips and so forth because the red blood cells were actually escaping from, from the generation of the extra red blood cells in the bone marrow and, and, the, and them leaving and going into my blood vessels. It was actually very painful. So I would have to take ibuprofen and so forth. So it's a strange feeling this drug is very powerful. And again, your kidneys are responsible for making this hormone because they're constantly watching, um, you know, because it's monitoring the blood, all the blood's going through your kidneys ultimately. So it's monitoring the oxygen levels and so forth of your blood. Low levels of EPO are constantly produced to compensate for normal blood cell turnover. When red blood cell count drops, such as during blood loss, the resulting oxygen deficiency state is detected by the kidneys, which respond by increasing their EPO secretion. This is also true of you. Let's say you start getting into exercise or working in a high altitude environment. Your kidneys are gonna pick up on this oxygen deficiency because uh, the amount of oxygen that's attached to your red blood cells is decreased. And, and, for, and for probably other reasons too, but. Ultimately, your kidneys are able to pick up on that and then release the hormone, erythropoietin. Of course, once the red blood cells increase and you've adapted to your exercise or you adapted to your high altitude environment, then the kidneys are going to release less erythropoietin. The kidneys are also involved in calcium homeostasis. In response to low blood calcium levels, parathyroid hormone, PTH, stimulates the kidneys to produce the hormone calcitriol, 
Calcitriol promotes absorption of dietary calcium in the small intestine and increases calcium reabsorption by the kidney. PTH itself also causes the kidneys to retain calcium. So that's pretty cool. All right, so uh, there's actually quite a bit more we can talk about in regards to kidneys, as you can see from um, that brief video. Um, here um, is the bladder um, filling up with the urine. And you can see there's, there's stretch receptors that are located on the bladder. And so what happens is the body can actually monitor, so as the urine begins to enter into the, into the bladder, the stretch receptors are going to start sending a signal to your central nervous system um, to tell you that you want to urinate or need to urinate. Now you can, through your parasympathetic nervous system, stop that motor neuron from firing. In other words, you can control not urinating. You've learned um, after you got past the age of being a baby, you know, how to control it. So babies, for instance, newborn babies cannot control urinating. There's no point in trying to potty train a newborn baby. That's ridiculous. But over time and maturation and learning, um, the parasympathetic nervous system can train your body not to urinate by inhibiting the sphincter, um, keeping that sphincter closed. Now, obviously you've trained yourself to be able to prevent yourself from urinating. Now there gets to a point where your bladder will fill up so much that you can't stop yourself, right? So obviously in extreme situations where you're holding it all day and you're being forced to, eventually you will not be able to stop that nervous system from work, working. But basically here's the stretch receptor sending a signal to these two different nerves. And then one of the nerves says, hey, let's urinate. And the other one is coming down the parasympathetic nervous system trying to prevent it. So anyway, that's a little bit about the control of the um, urination response coming down from the higher central nervous system. Let me see if there's one last thing I wanna say about the kidneys for today, and then I'll call it good for this lecture. Okay, let's recap one more time how the urine is formed. This animation should help a little bit. Is filter blood plasma, removing metabolic wastes, toxins, and excrete them in urine. During this process, they also maintain constant volume and composition of the blood, or homeostasis. Okay, so remember, this is the outer cortex, medulla, the nephrons going through it. We have our arteries in red and blue is our veins. Blood enters the kidney via the renal artery, which divides into smaller arteries, then arterioles. The arterioles get into contact with functional units of the kidney called the nephrons. This is where blood filtration and urine formation take place. The filtered blood then passes through a series of veins and exits the kidney via the renal vein. The urine is collected in collecting ducts and leaves the kidney via the ureters. Each kidney contains over a million nephrons. A nephron consists of two major parts, a glomerular capsule or Bowman's capsule and a long renal tubule. Renal tubules of several nephrons connect to a common collecting duct. There are three steps in the formation of urine, glomerular filtration, tubular reabsorption and secretion, and water conservation. Blood enters the Bowman's capsule. Via so remember, this is the podocytes. This is the glomerus, and this is the filtrate. So there's going to be enough blood pressure coming down from the afferent atrial to help the urine and the filtrate to exit the watery plasma that hold back the red blood cells. Via the afferent arterial passes through a ball of capillaries called the glomerulus, then leaves via the efferent arterial. 
the afferent arterial is significantly larger than the efferent arterial, creating a blood flow with a large inlet and small outlet. As a result, the blood hydrostatic pressure in these capillaries is much higher than usual. Hydrostatic and osmotic pressures drive water and solutes from blood plasma through a filtration membrane into the capsular space of the nephron. The filtration membrane acts like a sieve, allowing only small molecules to pass through. These include water, inorganic ions, glucose, amino acids, and various metabolic wastes such as urea and creatinine, and make up the glomerular filtrate. The amount of filtrate produced per minute is called glomerular filtration rate, GFR. GFR is kept at a stable value by several feedback mechanisms within the kidneys, known as renal autoregulation. GFR is also under sympathetic and hormonal control. GFR regulation is generally achieved by constriction or dilation of the afferent arterial, which causes the glomerular blood pressure to fall or rise, respectively. In a healthy person, the total filtrate volume amounts to between 150 and 180 liters a day. However, only about 1% of this is excreted as urine. The rem so it's amazing how, how much of the fluids are actually going through your kidneys. And so you can see that the kidneys are very, very good at concentrating urine, getting rid of that nitrogenous waste and other metabolic waste and toxins while maintaining the water that you have in your body. Otherwise you would become dehydrated rapidly and die. Obviously some animals that are good about ammonia like freshwater fish can get away with it. Remaining 99% is reabsorbed back to the blood as the filtrate flows through the long renal tubule. This is possible because the efferent arterial after exiting the Bowman's capsule branches out to form a network of so-called peritubular capillaries, which surround the renal tubule. The first part of the tubule, the proximal convoluted tubule, reabsorbs about two thirds of the filtrate. In this process, water and solutes are driven through the epithelial cells that line the tubule into the extracellular space. They are then taken up by the peritubular capillaries. Sodium reabsorption is most important as it creates osmotic pressure that drives water and electrical gradient that drives negatively charged ions. Sodium levels inside the epithelial cells are kept low thanks to the sodium potassium pumps that constantly pump sodium ions out into the extracellular space. This creates a concentration gradient that favors sodium diffusion from tubular fluid into the cells. Sodium is absorbed by symport proteins that also bind glucose and some other solutes. Nice Nearly all glucose picture. and amino That's... acids are reabsorbed at this stage. Remember, this is the proximal tubule too. So some of those salts and, and glucose are being reabsorbed right away. About half of nitrogenous wastes also reabsorb back into the bloodstream. The kidneys reduce the blood levels of metabolic wastes to a safe amount, but do not completely eliminate them. Some of the reabsorption also occurs by the paracellular route through tight junctions between epithelial cells. At the same time, Tubular secretion, where additional wastes and other solutes leave the bloodstream to join the tubular fluid, also takes place. So remember, this isn't happening at the glomerus anymore. This is so there is some drugs and wastes that are being gotten rid of right from the close association of the capillaries outside of the of distal tubule. The processes of reabsorption and secretion continue in the nephron loop, the loop of Henle, and the distal convoluted tubule. These parts of the tubule also have some other important functions. The main function of the loop of Henle is to create and maintain an osmolarity gradient in the medulla that enables the collection. So you can see how the concentration gradient is greatly different. So the cortex is around 300 osmolarity. Um, remember, that's the amount of solutes per liter, ultimately, just to keep it simple. And then it goes from 400 down to 1,200. 
more or less. And then so we'll have 500, 600, so forth and so on. And so that's what changes the concentration gradient. And now remember, this is a counter current. So this solution's coming down and going up. And then the urine's gonna be constantly getting concentrated before it leaves um, through the, the common duct. Collecting ducts to concentrate duct. urine at a later stage. The ascending limb of the loop actively pumps sodium out, making the medulla salty. The descending limb is permeable to water, but much less to sodium. As the water exits the tubule by osmosis, the- So remember, it's because of <clears throat> the solutes that are in the medulla, some of it being pumped out, some of it just leaving. So remember, because active transport takes place up here, while more diffusion takes place down here, as far as the salt movement, that the salt gradient is what's constantly moving the water out. So remember, the, initially the osmolarity is just a little bit higher in the medulla than inside the um, tubule, right? So that means the water's constantly moving out. And then when the water starts coming back up, the salts get moved out, making the water, making the urine more dilute again, and then ultimately being concentrated. The filtrate becomes more and more concentrated as it reaches the bottom. The ascending limb, on the other hand, is permeable to ions, but not water. As a result, the filtrate loses sodium as it goes up and becomes- So the water can't go through this side. So, so this side's all about getting rid of the water to the, to the medulla for reabsorption in the capillaries, because they're not showing you the capillaries that are here. <clears throat> and then the, this side, the water can't move, but the salts can get pumped out or diffuse out. Forms more diluted at the top of the loop. The medulla is in equilibrium with the loop and hence has the same salinity gradient, saltier at the bottom. Reabsorption and secretion in the distal convoluted tubule are under control of various hormones. This is how the kidneys respond to the body's needs and adjust the composition of urine accordingly. The collecting duct receives tubular fluid from several nephrons. The main function of the collecting duct is to concentrate urine and therefore conserve water. This is made possible by the osmolarity gradient generated by the loop of Henle. As it gets saltier deep in the medulla, the filtrate loses water as it flows down the collecting duct. No, because it's the medulla. The collecting right? duct is also and that under- medulla has a concentration gradient. Different hormones can inflect these different receptors as well, or, or channels. And the other way that these hormones work is on these um, blood vessels, remember, increasing, dilating them or concentrating them. So that's how those diuretic and antidiuretic hormones also work, is based on influencing the dilation of these capillaries. So anyway, thank you for your attention and um, I hope you have a better understanding of how kidneys work. Thank you.